Welcome to Charities Lean Forward. Be cyber safe for charities. This webinar is a joint collaboration with the Officer of the Commissioner of Charities, Charity Council, and Pro Bono SG. I am Andrew Lee and am your host for this webinar. First, some housekeeping matters. Today, we will be using Pigeonhole Live for our Q&A session. You can submit your questions at any point during the webinar and also upvote on any questions that interest you. If you have a smartphone or tablet with you, just launch your internet browser and enter www.pigeonhole.at into the address bar. Next, key in our event passcode, which is CyberSafe, as shown on the slide. Alternatively, you can click on the link shared in the chat function to launch Pigeonhole Live on your device. If you are viewing this webinar on your desktop or laptop, you should receive an invitation to launch Pigeonhole. Please note that today's discussion is not intended to substitute any form of professional legal advice. If you require specific legal advice, please consult a lawyer. For today's program, we will have an opening address by the Commissioner of Charities, Mr. Desmond Chin. This will be followed by sharing by Mr. Noor Ismail from the Singapore Police Force on scams, Ms. Jeannie Gan on cybersecurity, and Mr. Jeffrey Lim on knowing your legal rights. We will then walk through three case scenarios that charities may encounter. And finally, we will end off with a Q&A session. Uh, Mr. Chin, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And, and thanks very much, Andrew. It's my pleasure to, be jo to join you this afternoon. Let me first begin by thanking our partner, Pro Bono Singapore for organizing this webinar. I would like to also thank our speakers, Mr. Mohamed Noezmao of the Anti-Scam Command, uh, Ms. Jeannie Gan from Katspersky Cybersecurity, and Mr. Jeffrey Lim from Joyce A. Tan and Partners for being here with us today to share on the expertise on this area of cybersecurity. Today, we have more than almost 200 participants attending this webinar. It is a clear indication of our charity's interest uh, on this topic of cybersecurity and learning more about this topic. COVID-19 had accelerated the need for government, businesses, as well as our charities to embark on the digitalization journey. Our digitalization is no longer an option, but is essential for our survival and our success. According to a McKinsey study, the equivalent of five years of consumer and business digital adoption took place in only eight weeks from the beginning of the pandemic. And today, technology has become an integral part of our daily lives, in our work, in our homes, and in many of our personal transactions. However, with the increased rate of digitalization and adoption of new technology, organizations are now more exposed to cyber risk than ever before. Hence, it is very important to balance the need for cybersecurity in our digitalization transformation journey. Cybersecurity is crucial because it safeguards data against theft and loss. It also helps us to secure information and prevent our systems from virus attacks. Without the requisite cybersecurity measures in place, organizations cannot defend themselves against data breaches or losses. This makes them an easy target for cyber criminals. You will need to protect your charity against cyber crime as the consequences of not doing so can be very large. First, you could suffer significant reput reputational damage, resulting in loss of trust for your donors and your volunteers, which you have painstakingly taken years to build up. Or you could incur very expensive regulatory costs when you're fined for data or PDPA breaches. Or worse, you could also suffer heavy economic loss due to disruptions in your operations in conducting your activities and programs and services and the replacement of your systems that have been damaged. So please do invest in digital tools and solutions to protect your systems through the installation of firewalls and virus and detection programs. Secondly, your staff must also be trained to be alert to such cyber attacks. Unfortunately, people are often the weakest link 
So all our staff with access to digital tools must know about our company's cybersecurity measures and practices due diligence at all times. They must also be aware of the potential threats and dangers of opening unknown senders' emails and clicking on unknown URLs, links, and other email attachments. Our experts on the panel will share more on this during the webinar later. Digitalization has brought about a lot of benefits for all of us, but unfortunately, it's also created a rich environment and opportunities for cyber criminals to thrive in. Digital scams have spiked tremendously, we know that. It is therefore important to be alert to online impersonations or links and messages from organizations or individuals uh, promising quick returns. We need to be careful about that. Now, our CAD's Anti-Scam Command will be sharing more on this, uh, on the different types of scams which charities should be careful and mindful of, and the preventive measures that you ought to take. Earlier, I mentioned about investing in digital tools and solutions and sending our staff for training. But first, I would like to encourage all charities to tap on the Charities Capability Fund, which includes a training grant that supports board members and key staff to attend training courses relating to digitalization, data protection, and cybersecurity. Also, under the CCF Info Communications Technology Grant or ICT Grant. There's also funding support that uh, we provide of up to 40,000 per charity to support your digitalization efforts that includes digital solutions relating to cybersecurity. Some of you may already be familiar with the Tech and Go grant, so please utilize all these grants as they are available to you now. Along with NCSS, we will be conducting an, an IT needs an analysis survey soon. I would like to request that you respond to this survey so that we can have a better understanding of what support you need and see how we can then support you. Funding details can be found on the charity portal, uh, which is indicated later. Now this webinar will be a useful platform for all participants to learn from our experienced speakers and to tap on each other's experience. So please, do ask our, our speakers any questions that you may have so we can clarify doubts and we can strengthen our charities uh, accordingly. Now, I'd like to wish all of you a very fruitful afternoon and a very meaningful session as we hear our speakers and we join them later on today. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, Commissioner of Charities. Now, with that, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Jeannie Gan. Jeannie heads up Kaspersky's Public Policy and Government Affairs in the Asia Pacific, Middle East, Turkey, and Africa regions, where she provides leadership and counsel at the intersection of law, technology, and public policy. She frequently speaks on international platforms and is a thought leader in the space. She is also responsible for developing trusted relations with government and institutional stakeholders for the company, while integrating the business, communications, and public policy strategies with effective advocacy adverse efforts. Ginny holds a Juris Doctor in Law, an Honours Degree in Accountancy, and a Specialist Diploma in Counselling Psychology. Called to the Singapore Bar and a qualified lawyer, she is also a mediation coach and an international mediator. Having a rich and diverse career history, Jeannie started her journey in accountancy and law in big four firms. She was an award-winning young entrepreneur before spending a significant time as a senior government officer, having assumed several portfolios in the Ministry of Law and Foreign Affairs. Over to you, Jeannie. Thank you very much, Andrew. And it's a pleasure to be speaking at this webinar with everyone. Um, Without further ado, I think I will quickly dive into my quick 15 minutes presentation. Um, just really wanting to set the tone. Um, I believe everyone agrees that we actually are living in an age where we're experiencing um, a rise of digital marketing. And of course, um, in terms of the advent of internet of things, ruled by internet and the social media. Um, I do not believe there is, um, at least for the most of us, I do not believe there is a single day in our lives where we wake up and we go to sleep and for the entire day we have not switched on our social media app. 
right? So that I feel is um, the context, sort of the kind of life that we're leading right now. Now, um, the pandemic has an effect on us as well, undeniably. Um, I would love for us to say, you know, today that um, COVID is over. Unfortunately, it's not. Um, and has the last three years played a role in terms of cybersecurity or in terms of, of the kind of cyber threat that we're facing? Definitely. So I'll take you through some of these points. Um, in, in, the, in, in, in 2020, um, Kaspersky Mobile Products and Technologies actually detected um, between five to six million malicious installation packages. And I would just also like to say that, you know, based on the number of endpoint um, security solutions that um, Kaspersky um, has been installed in, 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 in all of its end users around the world, um, actually before COVID, there were 320,000 new malicious files um, that were uncovered on a daily basis. And post-COVID, guess what the number is? It's about 420,000 per day. Yeah, and this is this is this is this is shocking to some of you. But um, as far as people are concerned in the cybersecurity business, it isn't quite um, so shocking because um, indeed cyber attackers actually have have capitalized on the pandemic effect, um, where people have you know taken to to digital. Uh, platforms and devices to live their lives on a daily basis to sort of look for loopholes to attack weak links. Um, so also in terms of the new mobile banking trojans, um, you see that the, the numbers are quite staggering together with the new mobile ransomware trojans. Um, in terms of users in Southeast Asia, 6 and 10 are now shopping online also. Um, I suppose that includes you and I, and um, it's sort of quite... Um, apt because um, we've just had Thanksgiving and Black Friday sales, and I believe a lot of us have actually um, capitalized on the good um, discounts to actually do some online shopping as well. Now, um, in the next slide, I will be sharing a little bit of um, the useful statistics um, in Singapore um, based on the kind of you know uh, numbers that we have been experiencing in Kaspersky. Now. Um, in the next slide, you would actually see that um, the cyber threat landscape in 2021, which we've been monitoring very faithfully, looks as follows. Um, based on all the numbers that you see on this slide, actually the numbers have all gone up, except for um, uh, the mobile um, malicious installation packages. Yeah. And so you would notice that in terms of phishing attempts, that is something that we'll be talking about a lot uh, later. Um, Commissioner of Charities actually also alluded to this fact and also mentioned phishing. Phishing attempts actually are um, um, a quick and easy way for um, victims to fall prey um, to certain scams. Um, and we really do need to educate not just organizations, but also individuals and also maybe even um, the donors um, against phishing attempts. And we can talk a little bit more about that and we'll be sure to also address some of these um, issues in, in, in our senior discussion later. Now, um, also, I would like to move on very quickly to define the problem for you. Yeah. Um, and of course, I'm <laughs> very cognizant of the fact that I'm speaking with uh, people who are from, from charities, and you would be very um, interested to know what are some of the trends and what are some of the observations facing charities today. So, um, some of these incidents that happened um, in recent times overseas, you would be able to see on the following slide. Yeah. And these are involving charities from all around the world, um, whether it's India, Calgary, or even in the UK. Um, a recent report from the UK has actually shown that the number of cybersecurity breaches or attacks um, rises by more than 10 percent points from 39% to 50% when charities' annual incomes exceed 500,000 pounds. And of course, a quarter of these organizations that suffered attacks said that they had to deal with them on a weekly basis. Um, and the most common type of cyber attack for charities were what was phishing, which, which was identified by about 80% of the respondents, um, which often, of course, involves trying to con recipients into giving away personal details or passwords. 
And the recipients, of course, could be in all likelihood donors. Yeah. And so I think you know, that sort of sets the stage, I hope, um, and sets the tone of our discussion today. Um, I also want to next discuss a little bit about the increasing importance of cybersecurity. Where does cybersecurity play in, this, in, the, in the whole scheme of things? Right. As more of us rely on technology for daily activities, um, obviously cyber criminals um, themselves would be extremely aware of social behaviors which have been changing. And they would therefore um, devise their malicious activities around uh, our, our current behavior and our current preferences. So um, password theft is also on the steep rise. Um, so there is really a need to secure our devices um, in our organizations. And also then data becomes very critical. Not forgetting, not forgetting that as charities, obviously the kind of personal data that you are custodian of um, would be quite far reaching from beneficiaries, uh, which sometimes may include, um, depending on, on the services that we provide, may also include their medical history and their health status and all that. Um, also other forms of personal data um, of, of also donors, yeah, including financial information as well, especially if you are collecting donations. Um, and next, I would like to also um, talk a little bit about, you know, why we should, why, why a charity should be concerned with malware. Um, I'm not sure how many are familiar with the word malware, um, but I have mentioned a couple of times this word, and I just really, and I, I might be talk, mentioning this word a, a couple, a few more times throughout the course of this, this webinar. So I thought I just want to um, define the word for you so that you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, malware really is something that is bad. It's a malicious software um, that infects your computer, like you know, in the form of a virus or trojan um, or worm. You know, all these are different. So they're bad things. Just just remember them as bad things, and they can do a lot of damage, which includes stealing, corrupting, um, and even deleting the data. Right. So um, data of the the, the organization data of your donor, data of your volunteers, data of your employees, even past employees. And if you haven't flushed out the information and definitely your financial information as well, which is extremely important for a charity. Um, so now um, the next slide sort of just summarizes um, what a malware can do um, and how it's damaging because I did say it's a bad thing. So why is it a bad thing, right? So <laughs> devices that actually may be infected um, by malware and what are the modalities of this infection? Um, just very quickly, you know, by clicking on malicious links, you know, um, and downloading certain apps which actually have something bad in it, malware actually already um, in it. So for the moment you download it, you're actually also inviting the malware into your device. Um, and also, of course, using non-secure Wi-Fi or websites. So do be very careful. I do know that a lot of times. Um, we try to tap on Wi-Fi, which are unsecured in, you know, in the public space, especially when we're traveling and um, we don't have a local data SIM card, right? But just be very mindful, especially if you store financial information, other forms of personal data, or even contacts of, 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 of your friends and your, your family and, and, and certain other valuable information. You may want to think twice before you tap on a free, un public Wi-Fi of an unknown source. Yeah? And also, also, of course, using a device that's not updated with the latest, latest security um, fixes. Now, um, very quickly, I would also like to talk about something that I would call the most common modus operandi, which is, of course, phishing. Right? Is it actually a method that's been uh, used to fraudulently obtain personal and financial information, um, such as your login details and bank account numbers and credit card numbers. I will be making references to financial um, information a fair bit because I believe that this is something that um, is, you know, what charities such as yourselves will be dealing with almost on a day-to-day -day basis, especially if there is a fundraising aspect to your work. Um, cyber criminals often, of course, disguise as an individual or a reputable organization, including that of government agencies in their communications with you. And then they would use that to, you know, whenever if you were to just download a website or a link or you know, enter a website and, you know, and be enticed to, to, to key in your personal information and also online accounts, then that's where they would start stealing and misusing your information. 
Of course, without um, going too much into details, because it was, I, I just realized that it was also covered by ASP, it's my all already. In the next slide, I'll, I'm just really touching, I'm just going to touch and go on bank, re, banking related session. Um, so these are just samples of some, you know, messages that you may be receiving um, that asks you to, 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 to give out, to divulge your personal information, financial information. Um, and they would usually ask for your personal particulars, um, internet banking details, and your OTPs. So um, OTP is really like having a second lock to a door, right? You key in your password. And secondly, um, you have to key in an OTP that's sent to your personal device. But if you give away the, so true story, um, I had a business trip three weeks ago to Egypt, yeah, because because my portfolio covers um, not just Asia Pacific but also Middle East, Turkey, and the Africa region, and of course Egypt falls under Africa. So um, I obviously had to use my personal credit card details um, for booking of you know um, you know purchasing certain things, yeah. Uh, and then when I came back to Singapore over the weekend before I flew out on the next business trip, um, I actually received. Not one, not two, but three SMSs asking for an OTP to approve a certain um, transaction, right? And I, when I talk about, and, and these transactions are like, um, you, you, they would actually tell you, um, you know, a certain shop in Egypt, yeah, in Cairo or Luxor, you know, basically the, 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 the states that I travel to. And in terms of the amount, it's staggering, you know, I mean, at least to me, I think it's quite significant. It is that these are transactions in the thousands, right? So I think one of them was like 2000 plus US dollars. Um, another one was about 3005 and the third one was about 5007. So that's quite a lot, right? Um, it totals to more than 10,000 US dollars if I'm not careful. So now, um, so thank goodness for OTPs, one-time passwords. Please do not even begin to, to, to discount, you know, how important um, this 2FA or OTPs are in our lives and, and protecting us. They're actually very important. Now, I'm um, just moving right along. I thought I would also quickly touch on business scheme phishing. Um, I, that's what I had intended um, because basically it's about, you know, emails that end come into your inbox looking like they're legitimate, you know, like maybe they're from Microsoft Planner or they're from Outlook Express or, you know, certain, or maybe even from, from, from your Teams, Microsoft Teams account on so on and so forth. I'm um, looking like they're legitimate, but please, um, I think um, ASP Ismail had also, you know, touched on this. I won't go into details. And I think he had given fairly comprehensive examples of how not to fall into, it. you know, these subtle differences need to be looked out for and can be avoided. I would want to quickly move into solutions because I think that is the primary role I'm here to sort of, you know, hope to evangelize and, 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 and teach a little bit about what possible solutions um, charities such as yourself can, can take, what are some of the preemptive measures or curative ones for that matter. But I always stress that prevention is always better than cure. In both the physical health, um, which is why we're all taking vaccinations, um, and because, I mean, yeah, and obviously, you know, after having taken the vaccination, even if you get COVID, you know, the symptoms hopefully are not that bad in most circumstances. But also for online health, this is something that I, I, I truly, truly believe in. Now, um, very quickly, before we talk about protection, we want um, you to know what exactly you're protecting, right? So just remember this. Um, you're protecting your assets, right? You're protecting your intellectual property, personal data, your reputation of your organization, um, your stakeholders, donors, beneficiaries, employees, what's work, um, your board members, and of course your organization systems and database, right? Yeah. And so um, the, 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 the fundamental baseline is of course um, to make sure that you have a good anti-virus software that's installed. But what exactly do you look for? Right, I have it in this slide, which of course I'm very happy to be um, sharing after the webinar um, through, the organization, uh, through the organizers. But some of the factors that uh, should be considered would include you know, automatic update and scanning, malware removal capabilities as well, and user-friendly features so that it doesn't you know, stumble you. And of course, it must be cost-friendly. And also, please always look through what the user's uh, reviews say. And some of the features that an antivirus software ought to have would include anti-phishing, data backup, uh, privacy advisors, safe browsing mode as well, 
um, and as well as remote lock function. Now, um, VPN is also something that um, I would cover on my next slide, and I feel it's important, especially for organizations, right? VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. So um, with VPN, basically the, the data is traveling to and from your device um, encrypted. So that is um, a low hanging fruit, which I feel that all organizations has minimally held to, the, you know, to, to prevent the employees from, from sending back and forth emails with externals um, unprotected. And then also, um, I've already touched on the next slide, which is 2FA, two-factor authentication. Um, that includes OTP and, of course, um, within the Singapore context, we're talking about SingPath authentication, which is very important. And I hope you do have the SingPath app and you would frequently use it to authenticate certain transactions or access to your accounts, starting from government um, uh, websites to you know, um, you know, so other personal transactions as well in order to grant access to your personal data. Now, um, there were some questions I saw already in pigeonhole about passwords and all that, but I thought I want to then very, it's as if I knew, but I thought maybe I, I included this slide, so I just want to quickly touch on it, about password hygiene, about how to do it right, right? There are some pointers here, and I really want to um, you know, share with you. Um, please take a look at the, this slide. Um, if you know, after the webinar as well. You, you can also sometimes, if it overwhelms you, you don't know how to set, you know, a thousand and one different passwords, you can actually use a password generator, you know, to generate strong passwords automatically without you having to wreck your brain to try and come up with a new inventive creative password every single time for a different purpose. Now, um, some of the basic tips on, this is my second last slide, some of the basic tips on password conventions. Um, very simple, not trying to be funny, but a good example, if you like nasi lemak, like me, um, you can actually have an, no, but, I, but I promise you this is not my password. This is just for a, a sample to illustrate. But um, an example-based password could be nasi lemak rules, right? You can see on this slide. And let's just say, you know, I want to access um, website number one, then my password for the first three months could be nasi lemak rules uh, mar one, right? And then half a year later or so, you know, I change my password and I go down the menu. Yeah. So, um, so on and so forth. And of course, if you want to log into your Gmail, for example, then you can also use certain password, nasi lemak rules, rule one, so on and so forth. And of course, try to um, make sure that it's upper and lower case and it's um, alphanumeric minimally. Better still if you've got symbols. Um, last night, and I would like to, and this, and really this just forms the preliminary introductory package that I'm delivering to you in 15 minutes. Um, we can also, of course, discuss more when you pose your questions um, and as, as, as we discuss uh, scenarios after Jeffrey's presentation next. Right, so as an organization, I just want to summarize um, a few, um, you know, eight key points. First of all, train your staff and your board. Don't just train your staff, right? Because always the tone is set from the top. And I think it's of paramount importance that everyone throughout the organization um, at all ranks actually are fully aware of what are the things to look out for. And of course, secondly, motivate your staff to report suspicious things so that awareness and vigilance is extremely important. And of course, also encourage staff to be responsible individuals. Cyber hygiene is extremely important. Um, I still sometimes walk into um, certain offices um, as a visitor and I walk through, I'm taken through the cubicle areas of staff and I realize that I still sometimes see people um, have their passwords to their devices written on a piece of paper and pinned to the cork board. That's extremely worrying. Um, that is actually the uh, prime example of a lack of cyber hygiene. And of course, also, fourthly, systemic controls. We'll talk about endpoint security, updated patches, VPN, cloud security, so on and so forth, and 2FA for your donors as well. And um, defend your perimeter with the right cybersecurity solution. And please, run cybersecurity drills, pen testing, so on and so forth. Verify your supply chain software through security assessments and also um, um, monitor the latest trends and attacks. In, and, and this can be done through receiving threat intelligence feeds to know what is in the horizon, what are the latest trends in terms of the kind of cyber threats that are facing organizations such as yourself. So with that, I'll just hand the time back to Andrew. I hope it's been useful. 
Uh, thank you very much, Jeannie. That was really practical uh, advice provided. Um, now, our very next speaker is Mr. Jeffrey Lim. Now, Jeffrey is a lawyer specializing in data governance, cybersecurity, privacy, and artificial intelligence. His clients have uh, include global e-commerce multinationals and technology companies. Jeffrey has worked with many organizations in implementing legal frameworks and policies in addressing data protection and cybersecurity compliance programs in many sectors, ranging from healthcare, financial institutions, e-commerce, and fintech. He is the chair of the Law Society's Cybersecurity and Data Protection Committee and legal advisor to the Singapore Computer Society. He is a former chair of the Law Society's Project, Help, Project Law Help Committee and remains active in pro bono work. Jeffrey, do take it away. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and I want to thank all the speakers before because they've really set the table up very well. And the last thing, one of the last things I think uh, Jeannie mentioned was practice, right? Uh, drill, drill your teams, train your boards, and that's actually a very good note to for 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 a segue to to my uh, portion because one obligation uh, under the Personal Data Protection Act, the PDPA, which uh, does require a fair amount of practice, fair amount of actual um, dry runs and going through it, is the data breach reporting obligation. Now. The genesis of why uh, we're going to cover this at this session is because I had a look at the uh, COC uh, uh, resources on the PDPA, and it occurred to me that one of the obligations that hasn't been fully set out because it's fairly new, it came into effect last year, is the data breach reporting obligation. So I'm going to take the next 15 minutes or so that's allotted to me to take us through that. So what's going to be ahead of us? Well, I'll explain firstly what the data breach notification obligation is. What is it? What do you need to do? And then I'll talk about the CARE or CARE framework, right? It's, um, it's a way of thinking about how to deal with breaches when they occur. And you'll realize that the data breach notification, the reporting aspect, the R in the CARE, is really just a portion or a part of it. And because it's about preparation, uh, we need to understand what it is that should take place before anything uh, goes awry, right, in your in your digital life. So don't wait for the breach to happen and making sure you have SOPs in place. So let's talk about the data breach notification obligation. Uh, and it is, as I said, one of a bunch of obligations. So this chart may seem familiar to some of you. Um, there are many obligations under the PDPA, and the data breach notification obligation is just one of them. Uh, so it's just being bearing in mind that we could spend another session covering all the other obligations and the things that you should do, but uh, we'll set a bit more attention for this one because it's a little bit more uh, nuanced. So data breach reporting, right? Data breach notification. I guess the first question really is, well, what are we talking about? What data breaches need to be reported? And the truth is not every breach of the PDPA will trigger the data breach reporting obligations. Sometimes um, things can happen where uh, if it's internal, it stays in-house, it's not the kind of thing that you need to bother the PDPC with, the Personal Data Protection Commission, uh, which is the uh, body which receives data breach reports and uh, takes action on them. What's important to first understand is how the law actually describes a data breach. And this is the definition you see on screen. Data breach really in relation to personal data is the unauthorized access, collection, use, disclosure, copying, modification, or disposal of personal data. It seems quite wide, right? Then it goes on to say, or it can also be where you lose any storage medium or device on which you have personal data stored. And in those situations, that lost device could result in unauthorized access, collection, use, disclosure, copying, modification, and so on. So you know, right at the outset, you can understand that it's really about what happens to data when it's unauthorized. It's not something you permitted. And also what happens if you lose um, uh, the, the device on which data is stored. Seems fairly straightforward, two types of losses, but let's take it one step further and discuss what we mean by data breaches that don't have to be reported. I think we start there first. So one key point to note is that unauthorized disclosures within the institution, the organization, your, your company, 
does not need to be reported to the PDPC. Uh, it doesn't mean that if you have a data breach, a problem of sorts that took place within the company, that is not a serious matter. It is a serious matter, but it may not need you to report to the PDPC. So let's just start with an example here. Let's say a staff member in your company decides that he wants to access the personal data of say the beneficiaries of a charity for his own personal interest, maybe because he's interested in, in some on a personal angle about an individual within the group that he has. Now he's doing this outside of his scope of work. So he's not actually doing it because he's been authorized to do it. He's not doing it because it's part of his job as a uh, employee under the charity. He's doing it for his own personal interest. And in that kind of situation, he should not have accessed that personal data without getting the proper consent. And on top of that, by doing so, it is in fact a breach of the PDPA. There are obligations on the PPA which, which indicate that he should not be permitted to do that. And then if you discover it, you should report it to the data protection officer, your DPO in your organization. But in this example, the information was kept to the employee within the organization. It hasn't left the organization. So it's not as though the information went out. He didn't send it to someone. He didn't transmit the data. He didn't expose it to someone outside. It stayed within the organization. In that type of situation, it is a breach of the PDPA, but it is not a data breach that requires you to report it to the PDPC. So that's first a very important parameter setting understanding. Just recognize that that's one example. But Let's take this example and change it a little bit. What if the same thing happened? So staff A accesses the records and he's doing this again on his own personal whim. Uh, he has got no authorization to it. But in this case, he downloads it, he copies it onto a thumb drive, and then he walks off with it. Then as he's walking to his bus stop, he drops the thumb drive and someone who sees it picks it up. And then he goes and accesses it and he discovers the personal data on the on the drive. In that kind of situation, it's a little bit different because originally the, the first example involved the staff not disclosing the data outside the organization. Now, uh, someone else, an outsider has gotten hold of it. In that situation, uh, you actually have a data breach a situation that could result in reporting to the PDPAC. Now, here's the tricky thing. Even if you don't know that it had been picked up by a passerby, and all you know is that the thumb drive is missing, this is enough to know that you might have to report the breach. So this is where it gets a little bit nuanced, right? You don't have indications necessarily that the data has gone out to someone, but you can't rule it out. It is quite possible that someone has taken it. In that kind of situation, uh, you really do have a situation where you need to think about data breach reporting already because you really need to err on the side of caution when it comes to these situations. Okay, well, let's take another example. Let's uh, take a second example where let's say staff member B, because he, in this case, uh, this is a situation where a doc, an organization has held on to documents longer than is necessary. So we all know that in the PDPA, one obligation is that if you have exhausted all the business and legal purposes for holding onto data, you should either be securely disposing it or anonymizing it, right? You should be not be holding onto it forever and ever. In this case, uh, staff B has not disposed of documents, even though there's no reason to hold onto it anymore. Uh, at, this, at this time, Technically, he has breached an obligation under the PDPA, the retention obligation, but it's not that kind of obligation that, again, requires you to report to the PDPC. It's not the right thing to do, and if it's discovered internally, there should be steps taken to remove the data and also counsel the, the staff member. But there's no requirement at this stage to report to the PDPC. But what happens if we tweak the example further? So. You keep all that data in your archives and all that, and then you don't remove them. Someone then from the outside uh, penetrates your system, it exfiltrates the data, extracts the data from your database, and then they put it out on the dark web, they sell, send it, put it out for sale, you know, and there are hackers and there are people, malicious actors who will pay for this, right? So there's a whole economy, right, that thrives on this. And they can take that information and they go and, and abuse it. If this happens, there's no doubt you must conduct uh, considerations as to reporting of breaches. 
because the reality now is that it's possible that the data again has left the organization. In fact, this is one of the reasons why uh, organizations are counseled to try and stay within the retention obligation because you don't want to hold on to more data than is necessary. You can reduce the risk that you're carrying uh, um, you know, sensibly. Okay, so at that point, um, in this tweak example, you've got data going out and it therefore becomes a re potentially reportable situation. Now, let's talk about what we mean by potentially reportable, but in the context of this, the CARE framework. So I'll explain a little bit what that first means. So the CARE is really just a convenient acronym to explain the fourfold steps that you should take when there is a breach. C is for contain to contain the breach. A is to assess the breach, to determine whether how bad it is, right? What does it involve? Then the R report is really the obligation to report to the PPC if you have to, once certain thresholds are crossed. And I'll cover that a little bit later. The last uh, letter E is for evaluate, which is to consider how the, the breach has uh, took place and what are the things you can do to remediate and do better in the future. So the C-A-R-E. Now the R is obviously the reporting bit, and this is really the portion where we looked at data breach reporting, right? And when it comes to reporting, um, we talked about uh, not having to report breaches, which are just internal. Data stays internally, never lost, never exfiltrated, or never damaged. But we are uh, also looking at situations where the data does go out, is damaged. In that kind of situation, um, there's another threshold to think about, which is reporting reports become mandatory under the law. If the data that's lost is of the type which triggers significant harm, so it's the kind of sensitive data that could result in harm, uh, or it could be data which is uh, affects so many individuals that it reaches the threshold for significant scale. Once you hit these either trigger, significant harm or significant scale, you'll have to report the breach to the PBC within three days of that assessment. So you can see that there's a tight timeline around having to do that. And hence the reason why we need to get used to this process and understand what the SOP should be so that you can act in a timely manner. And then it can give you an opportunity to remediate uh, going forward. Okay, so let's look at C-A-R-E, each, each character. C is really for contain, and that's quite sensible. It's really just saying the first thing you should do is take steps to recover the data, limit the damage caused. If something is causing the breach, uh, if there's an open port, if there's a device that's sending out data, disconnected, shut it down, um, any step you can take to prevent further damage and further loss, right? If there was a bad practice that resulted in it that caused the breach, cease the practice immediately and then take all the steps you can to, to recover your data. Now, sometimes it's important for us to also ask ourselves a practical question, which is, is help needed to contain the breach? Do you need to reach out to a security team? Do you need to reach out to specialists? If you have to do so, uh, please do so, because it's the kind of, uh, often breaches are kind of uh, beyond um, the, the specialty of one particular job function or role. We need colleagues, we need third parties to assist us. OK, the other point is that in the containment process, you ought to keep an eye out for keeping and retaining records of what's happened, because that will be important for a review and investigation further on. So that's C, contain. And let's look at A, assess. And really, assessment is just understanding a couple of things, which is the nature of the breach. But a part of the assessment is, do I have to report, right? And you should make the assessment as soon as possible. Now, what are you assessing? Now, remember we said uh, the significant scale and significant harm, right? So first we have to understand what was breached, how much data was involved, how many individuals were impacted, and what kind of breach was it? When we determine that there are certain thresholds which are made, we can uh, reach, we can decide whether the report should be made whether an obligation comes up. Now the assessment is um, taken through a number of questions, but some of the questions you could ask yourself for the asset, A for assess is how many people were affected, right? So sometimes there's a little bit of a 
you, you have to separate the difference between what's a record and a, an individual, right? One record may refer to 100 individuals, or maybe 10 records refer to one individual. So records and individuals are not the same. Just make sure you sift through the information to determine what actually was lost. What kind of personal data was lost, right? Is this uh, no, this is very surface level business contact information, your business emails, or is this something more significant? NRIC numbers, passports, health data, you know, or anything sensitive, right? You have to catalog and understand what the risk of data is by looking at the data that was lost. And whose personal data, right? How many individuals are involved? Are there many? And then understand also uh, if there were any individual measures that could be implemented to address the impact of a breach of data. So in other words, is there anything you can do now to safeguard the individuals affected by the breach? Perhaps by alerting them in advance, telling them that a breach has happened and you should take precautions, look out for suspicious messages and so on, or change your passwords, right? And then you have to start assessing who might have gained access to the, the compromised personal data. Is it known who the attacker is or do you have a sense of where the attacker might be? Uh, and then you have to ask yourself, the data that has been taken, what kind of impact might it have on transactions? So if you think about financial data, that would mean that you have to alert the individual because there could be financial implications. Or, or are there security credentials, passwords that were stored for a particular site, for example? And then how long um, has the data been publicly accessible before uh, it became aware of the breach? So sometimes you don't discover a breach right away, you may discover a breach only some after some time has passed. So that length of time could be important because harm could have arisen during that time. And that may also mean that you must act more speedily. So that's the assessment piece of it. And let's look at R. And really R is for report. And you can see on screen now, really, the section that basically de de defines or imposes the obligation to report the data breach, right? So this is new legislation that came in effect 1st February, 2021. And the reporting obligation really uh, dovetails to really two types of criteria, right? There's the significant scale and the significant harm criteria. So this table really sets out um, the benchmark. For significant scale, uh, 500 more individuals, right? If you get 500 more individuals, it doesn't matter how trivial the data was, you do have to report to the PDPC. Uh, on the other hand, even if it's just one individual who's affected, but the individual's information that was affected was of any, the nature which causes significant harm, so it's sensitive to some degree, then you'll also have to report. And so it's two different benchmarks, right? It's either or. And the bottom row, you can notice that significant harm can mean a lot of things. It can mean, for example, full name or alias of the individual and uh, or his IC number plus any of the prescribed classes of data. Now, there is a particular list that the uh, law has put out in terms of the types of data, which if you combine it with those uh, full name and IC or, or IC number, that would create a, a situation where significant harm is presumed. And there may be other categories as well. So the law does set out a number of list of types of information. In the main, anything that is sensitive or potentially capable of being abused that could result in harm is the type of information you would consider significant harm. And so if you think about even category two in this uh, row below, we talk about an account identifier, which is maybe your username, your email, or whatever it is used to register individuals, and then any password or, to or access code, for example, that itself is already a significant harm. So being aware of the nature of the information can also inform you as to whether, in fact, the obligation gets triggered. So then we talk about the last letter of, of the CARE framework, which is evaluate. And really the evaluate part E is about post-mortem, right? To understand what happened in the past and what can we do better. So look at through all those things that has happened. How did it come up? How did you respond? And what was the outcome? That really will inform you on that as well. Okay, then when we talk about assessing evaluation, it's the type of information that you look at with uh, in, really in terms of root cause analysis, your post-breach actions taken, your data management breach response, your, um, you might cause you to reevaluate your existing measures and processes. You might have to understand closer what were the roles of external parties in the breach. How well did the team manage the breach? How much training was needed? Uh, 
how quick and effective was your response? So these are all things that feed into improving your, your approaches in terms of going forward. And that also means that when you're looking at data breaches, you should be thinking about data breach preparation. And preparation is really uh, key because we're talking about training, right? So you can ask yourself some key questions at the start. Have you appointed anyone, for example, to be a breach response team, right? And whoever you designate as a breach response team can be one person, two person, three persons, whoever you can rotate and make sure you work as a team in a situation that evolves. You, are they the right people for the job? Do they have the training or the skill set? Are they prepared? Do they know what to do? Have you figured out some of the practical steps about data breach preparations? Have you figured out how to escalate and, and, and report and a breach? Are there action points, things which people must know to do immediately when a breach occurs? Numbers to call, people to contact, things to be to set into motion, right? Um, do you have perhaps uh, uh, a fixed timeline around how things must happen? So there must be action by three hours, four hours, five hours, or something like that, right? And because staff do leave organizations, employees do rotate and go on, it's always important to document it, right? Because you have to institutionalize the knowledge so that even though you have turnover, people still have the same reference points going forward. It's not forgotten once an individual leaves the organization. And so as part of beach preparations, it's also helpful to think about additional things, which is uh, breach contact lists and escalation processes, flow charts, step pro uh, process statements, internal reporting forms, because when a breach happens, you know, tensions can be high and you want to remind people what to be able to report in terms of information that must be captured at the point of contact, right? And then external vendor contact lists, who to reach out to. And then from time to time, you should be conducting just desktop exercises to keep it fresh in everyone's mind. This also helps people understand uh, how these processes and tools get together. And these are practical steps, really. Now, in terms of internal reporting forms, really the type of fields that you want to track and to force individuals to make sure they pay attention to when they escalate internally is what kind of data was compromised? In what form was it? It was electronic, was it a thumb drive? Was it a piece of paper? How many records were involved? How many persons were affected? <laughs> Uh, were other persons involved? Was there a third party involved in the situation? Uh, are there partners, for example, whose data was compromised? Um, has the breach been stopped? Is it still ongoing or have, uh, have you sealed off the breach completely? Uh, and are you preparing any statements, whether it's for the PPC or members of the public or affected individuals? And then to think about how you continue to update someone. Uh, usually forms can have uh, fields that say this is the latest update to keep track of how you, you know, situation evolves because as information comes in, facts may come, new facts may come up. So in that context, um, you can see that breach preparation also might include you having to reach out and issue statements to affected individuals. And in that kind of situation, uh, it's quite apart from reporting to the PPC, you may be obligated to also contact the affected individuals so that they can take steps to protect themselves. Uh, now, there are some exceptions. The law does say you don't, there are situations where you may not need to report, um, but you know, these are really exceptions. And what you should be thinking about is how do I safeguard the data such that I try and fall within those exceptions? One of the things that they do mention is implementing technological measures, things like encryption, for example, to a certain degree that will protect the data. So either, even if it's lost, the chances of someone being able to access the data in a, uh, is limited because of the encryption or the technological measures that you put in place. Uh, at the same time, there may be other situations that you have to report to other law enforcement authorities because say it's a cybersecurity incident and you have to report to the police. In that situation, you might be told by the authorities not to report, uh, report to individuals. If that's so, and if it does happen, uh, you ought to abide by that as well. The PPC itself is also going to be in a position to tell you whether you need to report to the individuals. So one of the things you always do when you report to the PPC is to consult with them and get their guidance as to whether you should be reporting or not. Now for charities or not-for-profit organizations, the reality of it is that we're not spared we're not spared from the same obligations under the PPC, PPPA. And I guess not because the PPA 
uh, governs uh, or protects individuals, right, who engage uh, with any organizations. And as charities, we are members of the same public. And it's our obligations really to think about how to responsibly handle personal data. So no special exemption is given to charities per se. So what I can say is try and get law help. Right, uh, help where necessary. There are multiple resources out there. Uh, I used to chair the Project Law Committee the pro, um, of uh, the Law Society. Now it's of Pro Bono SG. It's a collective uh, where volunteer lawyers get together and uh, they raise their hands to help uh, organizations with non-litigation matters. And this can include um, data breach advice, advisory and data um, protection um, support. Uh, so please, that's the link in there, and that's the contact email. And I heartily recommend that you reach out to it. It's staffed by a very willing and capable secretariat uh, and backed by uh, very willing and able uh, lawyers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Um, that was really quite an informative session. Now, before we actually move on to the panel discussion, Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey, we actually have some questions from the audience uh, regarding uh, scenarios that you actually raised in your discussion. So our very first question from our audience is actually, now remember you were speaking about where an outsider picks up a thumb drive with uh, personal information. Um, now, the audience will actually like to know, do I actually need to report um, this to the PDPC if, if the thumb drive, for example, is actually encrypted with a uh, BitLocker or any other encryption technology? Uh, the, the short answer is yes, you do, because reporting to the PDPC is a different um, requirement from reporting to the affected individuals. So what I said was that um, in terms of reporting to the affected individuals, the fact that you use encryption can make a difference. Right? It affects the reporting to individuals, but the reporting to the PPC, the law doesn't differentiate. Even if it is encrypted, you ought to report to the PPC. So the short answer is it affects the reporting, does not affect the reporting obligation to the PDPC. Uh, you should still go ahead and continue to report to them. Thanks, Jeffrey. Now, another question following your presentation earlier. Um, we have a question here. So what if for example, the breach only involved name and NRIC number, but there is no other prescribed data, and it's actually below 500 individuals. Does that still constitute significant harm under the PDPA? Less, okay, so we're not talking about um, scale anymore because it's less than 500. And you're talking about just the, was it just name and NRIC number? Yes, just the name and the NRIC number. Okay, so you know, if you go back to, I think it was a few slides back, there's a definition of significant harm that's kind of set up there. I don't know if you can get it on screen. Well, okay, if you if you can, essentially it's a full name, right? Or IC number and any prescribed class of data. So in other words, that's right, this that slide, right? So there's an and there, which in other words, what you do is you, if it's just name and NRIC number, that in itself does not necessarily on its own uh, constitute something that's that requires that triggers significant harm, okay? But I must say that the significant harm definition is not closed. In other words, the law doesn't say only this is significant harm, right? This is one of the areas which says the, um, the list you see here would be deemed significant harm. There's no question that it is. So the, 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 the bigger question really is if there was nothing else on that record, and there's no indication that those numbers can somehow be traced um, to a particular uh, account identifier or can't be used uh, or tied to any prescribed class of data, then you should consider this as fairly voluntary. It could be that there is no requirement because it doesn't meet the threshold, but you should be aware that you ought to assess it from a full context. In other words, is there anything else along the breach that could indicate that there was some situation that involves uh, more than just what you see, right? The problem with breaches is you always see what's immediately in front of you, but the context is always the hardest part to detect. I hope that helps. Thank you very much for answering the audience's questions, Jeffrey. Um, now we will invite Jeannie back for the panel discussion. Um, for this panel discussion, we will be walking through three case scenarios dealing with data breach, fundraising, and um, how we actually implement a cybersecurity solution. 
Now, for our very first case scenario, it actually concerns fundraising activities carried out by charities, which is basically the lifeblood of charities. Now, assuming I have just started out my first job at a local charity, uh, help me out. Um, I don't have any experience with work at charities, but I've actually been placed in charge of one of Help Me Out's fundraising events for the quarter. Uh, I have the existing contact list of donors, but I'm also told to create new materials to raise awareness and secure more donors. My superior told me, be aware of cybersecurity risks and think about the Personal Data Protection Act as I do my work. However, I don't know much about cybersecurity or data protection. What do I do now? Are there any do's and don'ts when it comes to fundraising? I, I think I should just call all my donors to secure funds and raise awareness of the event. Is that all right? Mm, I'm also thinking of just approaching businesses by cold calls or just writing to the businesses at their email addresses. Is that all right? Um, Jeffrey, can you share with us your thoughts on what I should do or plan to do? Mm, is that Am I in the right direction? Okay, so as a it's a real life problem, right? Um, so I think to make it sort of more realistic as well, um, if you have a current database of individuals who you already have contact details for, really the first thing you should ask yourself is uh, how did you get that information? Because if you have a pre-existing relationship with these individuals, you may have engaged them in the past, you may have collected their contact details uh, in, a, in other circumstances. <clears throat> And perhaps those circumstances were such that you had the consent or permission for them to, for you to contact them. So for example, a donor may have given you information. Uh, maybe he doesn't mind staying in contact with you and you actually have uh, a consent uh, from him in writing or sorts or in past communications, which indicate you can reach out to the individual. But more likely than not, um, you may not have full information or full uh, details, right? As to whether uh, you actually have this consent up front to contact him. And that's really the first important thing to recognize that you're really trying to nail down whether or not you have permissions to use the date uh, information that you have to contact them and solicit donations. Um, before we get to cold calling, that's really this first point, which is um, how do we go about ensuring that we do have some control or safeguard around the use of this data? Now, if you don't know and you're not sure how you have this information, um, one of the things that is worth doing really is to first think about how you would reach out to these donors to clarify whether or not um, what their position would be. So for example, uh, you may have a list of donors. They have all been collected over the years in the past you weren't very clear as to whether you had consent, but you do have their details. So one of those um, public facing messages can be sent out to the individuals, to their e to whatever contact details that you have to inform them that you know, we have, um, thank you for in interacting with us as a charity before. We've collected your data before on, a, on account of your past interaction with us. We wanted to check with you whether or not you would like to stay in touch with us and whether you would like us to continue to send you information or reach out to you and so on. And this is like a courtesy email or courtesy outreach to make sure that you clarify the basis on which you can continue to uh, communicate with these individuals. Now for the individuals who will continue to uh, support the, the charity, they, they probably won't have an issue because they would like to stay in touch with you and you would get the returns. But for those who say, no, no, take me off your mailing list, take me off your list and everything, you at least have a clear indication uh, that you, you shouldn't be using their data anymore. And I think that's a first critical step to make sure that you can continue your outreach work in a way that is responsible over the data that you have. Um, on the other point, which is concerning cold calls. So I think, um, I think you all, uh, I don't know if you're all aware of the do not call registry. It's one of those things which require us to uh, make sure that before we make phone calls, send SMSs or any text messages, uh, we tend to scrub these numbers that we intend to, to send through against the DNC registry uh, maintained uh, by the PPC. And if it turns out the numbers on the list, uh, you can't call them unless you had prior written uh, consent specific to that number. And if that happens, then you know that you can only really contact the individual unless you've, when you've had the uh, uh, prior written consent 
specifically for it. So again, this is one of those things where uh, before you make the step of making cold calls and sending those text messages, um, do your do the task of make, scrubbing against the DNC and then reach out to them. Now, technically the DNC doesn't cover potentially solicitations for donations, but um, the definitions of what is covered under the type of messages uh, is fairly wide and open-ended. Um, and you, you do need to be careful about the content over what you put into a message that you send. So although a, a strictly a reach out, hello, we're continuing our relationship with you, we'd like to know a bit more about whether you want us to continue to stay with you, that type of message is fairly uncontroversial. The way you package the message and anything else you add into that message uh, could un inadvertently trigger the DNC prohibitions. So for that reason, it's worth uh, taking a little bit of uh, precaution and making your first outreach to be a very safe one after you've done the DNC scrub. Uh, Jeannie, any advice on your end? Well, I think um, Jeffrey gave a very comprehensive response directly to what the question is asking, but I thought, you know, um, because he sort of told everyone what um, you can or cannot do, um, I thought I want to just very quickly touch on what you should or should not do because this is a question specific to fundraising activities for charities and I think you really don't want to be mistaken to be a scammer um, and a lot of you know a, a, a lot of the content of ASP Ismail and from SPF um, you know that he shared was actually surrounding the, the topic of scams and you know you don't really want to be mistaken to be a scammer because that would derail your fundraising efforts, which we all know it's not easy for charities. I'm, I'm a volunteer for many charities in my depot and I'm extremely aware of, of, of how painful it can be. So, you know, scams through phishing, of course, um, is a method that's used to fraudulently obtain personal financial information. And, you know, a lot of charities get hit by it. So, or, or rather, a lot of people who, 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 who deal with charities get hit by it. So, um, and so do take note as a charity um, of some best practices do not unnecessarily um, um, include you know, links or you know, additional links for people to click on apart from your legitimate website. You know, so for instance, um, I, I tend to be a bit more conservative. So instead of using a micro site that is hosted outside of your official website, um, which I feel sometimes tends to raise unnecessary suspicions um, in this day and age, um, I would rather just use a, a sub page in my in my official website um, if I want to call for clients um, and if you really really have to use an external website uh, maybe even because you know you're a small charity and you don't actually host your own website which can happen then you can use well-known you know fundraising sites such as giving.sg and you name it right so so and also do not ask for unnecessary personal details over phone calls or emails or text messages, any form of communications, um, because then there is a tendency to sometimes over ask. Um, but really before it's, it's a little bit commonsensical as well, before you, you, you ask for information, you know, ask yourself, um, do we really need this information, right? To take, to take things forward. So for instance, like, does it matter what the person's age is? Does it matter, um, you know, the marital status or even the gender? Um, you know, if you're calling for donations. So some of these things are, are I feel need to, you, know, you need to bear in mind, yeah. Thanks very much, Jeffrey and Jeannie. Now, the second case scenario we have is what a charity or an organization needs to consider if they are actually intending to put in place a cybersecurity solution. Um, now, having successfully navigated my first fundraising event at Help Me Out and realizing that there are cyber security issues that could actually implicate a charity, I've decided to focus on figuring out if there could be cyber security solutions put in place for Help Me Out. Um, I'm really concerned that I don't have this expertise to actually decide on cyber security needs. Um, also, Help Me Out does not have much of a budget for sophisticated solutions. Should I simply just save on this sum and divert all the budget to fundraising work instead? Uh, Jeannie, is there a standard mm -hmm. cybersecurity solution that is applicable to any charity or, or are they actually customized depending on their needs? Is a cybersecurity solution even necessary? Well, um, 
Great question. Um, I really don't want to be overly prescriptive on specific solutions, um, especially because I do work for a particular cybersecurity vendor. So I don't want any bias in this. Um, it's also not my place to do so in this webinar, but I would give some um, overarching sort of principles to look out for. Um, so first of all, I think um, it really depends on the, the scale of the charity organization um, in question. Of course, in, in this particular case scenario, it's a small charity, but, but broadly speaking, Generally, obviously, when you have a large charity, right, so your networks will actually be a little bit more far reaching, the amount of data that you're protecting might be more, um, the systems may be a little bit more sophisticated, maybe some of the processes are in fact even um, automated, then obviously, the suite of cybersecurity solutions or technology that is used to provide that cybersecurity aspect um, of your organization needs to be um, a little bit more customized and to some extent, therefore, would cost more as well, right? Otherwise, some of the off-the-shelf solutions can um, be a sort of a baseline uh, for all. So we're talking about endpoint security, cloud security, if you're using um, cloud services to, to, to store data, for instance, these are very good starting points. But apart from just solutions, which I'm talking, you know, it, it's really about installations, you know, you should think about something beyond just you know, the, the, the right software to, to, to install and so on and so forth. You should think about your infrastructure, which, so I'm actually talking about systemic controls. I'm talking about the way people think. So first of all, I think um, it's important. Some of, some of the tips I can offer would be maybe to develop a comprehensive patch management strategy. So uh, patching infrastructure and software to address known security vulnerabilities is of course key um, against common um, cyber threats. And of course, um, you know, you should also carry out a cybersecurity audit on your networks and to remediate any weaknesses that you discover in the perimeter or inside the network. So periodically doing this, maybe on a six monthly basis to review your system-based control configurations and, you know, reporting outputs is actually very important as well. So we're talking about, you know, if there are IT people, I do know that there are actually IT people from charities that are attending this, um, so they would know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm talking about penetration testing, for instance, you know. And of course, I'm um, also installing NT-APT, you know, NT-Advanced Persistent Threats and EDR solutions, NAP, Enabling capabilities for advanced threat discovery and detection is actually very important so that you can do preemptive work, right? With the latest threat intelligence um, and, and such information, you can actually um, prevent and you know what is happening to other organizations and you actually can be, take more preventive measures. Um, and also, I think it's um, important to formally review and um, the advantages and disadvantages of outsourcing IT support or cybersecurity functions. Um, and decide for yourself whether this is something that you want to do in-house, or it may sometimes even be cheaper to outsource it to an expert. Um, and of course, um, my last point, um, I feel is it's probably the own, is the single most important point. I think it's to do with the mindset, right? starting from the leadership. So I'm talking about you know, whether the board clearly champions a good cybersecurity culture, right? Are they clear about the role in the event of a cyber incident? Um, what are the protocols in place? Um, and are these protocols regularly tested? As for data protection, you know, just also ensuring that the trustees um, of, of the charity and even audit committees are up to speed on the importance of cybersecurity can actually make uh, managing things a lot easier as well. Um, and lastly, I've said this during my presentation, Prevention is always better than cure. So do spend on awareness and education for people throughout your organizations. Um, to protect the corporate environment, you have to educate your employees, your stakeholders, your board, your, your, your whoever, right? So dedicated training courses actually can help. And some of these um, uh, are even for free. Um, I would be happy to stick in you know, one such free training in the chat for everyone later. Um, it's on security awareness and all that, you know, and there actually also are free lessons on how to protect against ransomware attacks, which are starting to hit out at charities increasingly, and I believe will be covered in the next case scenario. So um, I would just pause there. Yeah. Thanks very much, Jeannie. Now, now, in relation to the last point you mentioned about the 
management and informing the board. Now, Jeffrey, is, is there anything that you feel that I personally need to share when I broach any cybersecurity solution to the management and or the board? I think the, I mean, Gene's done a fantastic job covering most of the, the points. I think the most important point from my perspective is um, that, you know, because in most organizations, people are the weakest link in the sense that mistakes tend to happen at the human level, that the board doesn't just see it as an IT issue. They need to see it as being uh, also an organizational um, staff culture awareness and know-how level as well. I mean, I would suggest that that, that just add that on to all the discussion that that Jeannie's added. I think that's important for the board to understand as well. So Jeannie and Jeffrey, so feel free to chime in. All right, we've got a couple of questions regarding cybersecurity solutions from our audience. Now, the first one is basically uh, touching on the password issue. Are there actually ways to enhance IT security without using passwords? Ginny, perhaps? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Uh, are there ways to enhance IT security without having to use passwords? Passwords are really important. Um, I, I think I saw this question being posed at the start of the webinar before my presentation. So I, and, and which is why I tried to address it during my presentation, um, that basically passwords are really essential. It's it's like the baseline of everything. I'm so sorry that you don't like it, but it's it, today, you know, the starting point is, is so different from where we were even as recent as just 10 years ago. Um, it is like the basic to everything. It's like not having a password is like not having a, a, a lock to your, your home's door, right? And in fact, even today, based on the kind of, um, you know, op, op, modus operandi of, of, of cyber attackers and hackers and scammers and all that. Um, having one password, one layer of password is no longer enough. And so that baseline actually has moved at one level and which is why now we're talking about 2FA, two-factor authentication, which I also mentioned about in my, in my, in my presentation. And, 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 and so which is why I was also talking about one-time passwords and how essential it is. And hopefully also inspire you on the importance of it by giving you my real life example from my recent travel and coming back and, you know, the OTP literally saved me more than $10,000 worth of, uh, of money um, from a potential, from, from potential fraudulent transactions spent out of my, my, my attempts on my credit card. So um, long, long answer is as such, short answer is that I'm sorry, no, passwords are completely essential. <laughs> uh, again, related to passwords, we have another question from the audience, which is, Password protected files can actually be hacked as well. Um, how safe is it to actually email password protected do documents? Are there alternatives to emailing password protected documents? Ginny, any help there? Hmm, this is really technical. I'm not sure I can give the best answer. Um, but I think there are alternatives, definitely. So for instance, if I were to send a file, I would actually use a secure um sort of a Dropbox equivalent um, that my company subscribes to. Um, it's like a data storage um, platform, uh, which is password protected and self encrypted. And then I would generate a share link for people to download that particular file. Um, and then all that you see, or anyone who intercepts emails would see in the email would just be that particular share link. And without access to the particular system or the platform, or and especially definitely not that particular file, you will actually not be able to, 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 to access the file at all. Um, and I, I think that actually is um, relatively um, economical as well as effective way of protecting files. Jeffrey, any tips? Given that you're a lawyer, you're a practicing lawyer, I'm sure you receive lots of sensitive information. Yeah, well, well um... What, what Jeannie has just described is actually now common for us. Uh, and so, yes, that seems to be the standard that everybody's hewing to. Uh, so not, nothing to add really on top of what Jeannie's mentioned. All right, moving on, we'll, we'll go to our final scenario now, which actually concerns data breaches, uh, an event that many of us actually hope that we don't have to encounter. Mm -hmm. uh, now, 
back to my character and help me out. Uh, one morning when I actually started work, uh, I received a strange email in my inbox stating that I was to make payment of 50,000 Sing dollars in Bitcoin to an organization called Make You Pay as they have seized control of Help Me Out server containing all our donors and recipients' personal data. Now, I initially dismissed this as just a bad joke. However, when I actually tried to access Help Me Out's recipient database, I realized I am locked out. So is every staff. I mean, what has happened? How could this have happened? I am crushed and I'm absolutely at a loss about what to do. Jeannie, what happened here? What should I be doing? <laughs> um, yes. As far as you are concerned, there's a data breach, and yes, that's not untrue. But as from a from a slightly you know um, more professional point of view, actually, it's a ransomware attack. Yeah, and I have made references to ransomware attacks um, earlier on in today's webinar. But I think it's time for me to sort of delve into it a little bit more um, for the benefit of everyone. So what has happened, right? Um, and how could this have happened, and what to do? Um, I thought I could share a little bit about Colonial Pipeline, yeah, which is a very high profile ransomware attack that happened in recent times, um, especially you know, in the middle of COVID and affected a lot of us, those of us who are dealing with first world problems of very high petrol prices during that period of time. Um, we would all know what the Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack incident was all about. But let me just take you through this because I am also noticed that we do have some time. So I think I would like to spend a little bit more time on this scenario. Um, so during the period from May 7 to 12 um, last year, the fuel transportation over the Colonial Pipeline, um, which is basically the largest pipeline system for refined oil production in the US, was suspended right over six days. Um, and the cause of this was a cyber attack involving this ransomware um, group that's called Dark Side, right? Um, so actually what happened, um, just in, in gist, Colonial Pipeline is one of the largest pipeline operators in the US. They deliver about half of the East Coast, um, half of the fuel for, for the East Coast, including gasoline, diesel, heating oil, jet fuel, and so on. So when this was discovered, the, the malware had actually infiltrated the company's IT network um, and pipeline operators um, that forced um, the entire pipeline to shut down some of the uh, OT systems to prevent it from spreading. Um, so this resulted in the pipeline's operation from being completely blocked. Right? Um, Bloomberg came out very quickly to report about this. Um, and according to them, the attackers were actually able to obtain about 100 gigabytes of data in just two hours before the attack's active phase even began, right? And so exactly how the malware, the malware which I talked about, penetrated the company's network was actually not known. Um, but um, based on the researchers and cybersecurity experts, standard ransomware distribution schemes um, such as phishing emails. So you're, you're starting to hear some of these keywords huh, being mentioned over and over again. Phishing emails, vulnerability, exploitation, the use of um, previously stolen um, RGP or VPN accounts of employees were actually among the, the methods being used. Um, so for the first time since 2014, of course, all of us experienced it, um, the average price of a, ga a gallon of gasoline actually increased to almost $3 USD, right? So the next day on the seventh day, um, which was on the 13th of March, if I'm not wrong, the company actually started fuel deliveries in a majority of its markets. However, you would have thought that everything is business as usual, but not so. The company actually warned that it would take some time for the product delivery supply chain to return to its normal capacity. So what actually happened, right? And by now, six days had lapsed, um, you know, and Colonial Pipeline had paid the ransomware hackers about 5 million US dollars in cryptocurrency as early as the first day of being hit. And in fact, several hours, just a couple of hours after being attacked. So why did it take them so long to restore the pipeline's operation? So that, that's really because the decrypting tool. So when a ransomware attack takes place, basically you get locked out of your IT systems and your computer whatsoever. You do not have access to your data. And in order to do so, there would be a message that you see from the ransomware attackers asking you to pay a ransom sum 
So what they did basically did is you hold your data at ransom. And the only way to release it and regain control, hopefully, is to pay a ransom fee. Right. So, and then they would maybe give you a decrypting tool. But in this case, the decrypting tool was received um, from the attackers too slowly that the company had to continue using its own backups and to slowly, slowly restore its systems. So now, what is the impact and what is the learning point here? To me, it's really not to pay the ransom, right? So um, along you know, with some of these big game hunting, you know, ransomware emergence since 2020, um, you would have observed that criminal groups are getting bolder. Um, and usually there's a huge syndicate behind every single silo operation, right? Where these attackers actually trade secrets of certain vulnerabilities in certain organizations, charities, systems, whatever. And they do this over the dark web where you don't see. And they will ask for very high ransoms and they are super opportunistic. You know, as far as we know, um, these groups don't flip through Financial Times or you know, um, Forbes magazine to decide who to go after next. Basically, they see a weakling, they see a loophole, they go in straight, whether it's a big, small, medium, charity, organization, business, whatsoever. So now, just very quickly, before I finish, I want to touch on, so now you know what a ransomware attack is, and in all likelihood, this is you know, what Andrew Post from Help Me Out is, is, is in all likelihood that. So what can we do? to prevent a ransomware accident, because again, prevention is better than cure, right? So you should actually enable ransomware protection for all endpoints. And there is a free um, anti-ransomware tool for businesses um, that shields your computer and servers from ransomware and other types of malware. Um, it prevents exploits and it's compatible for um, other installed security solutions, even if it's not Kaspersky, okay? So I'm actually gonna share that, or maybe it's already been shared with, with the organization, organizers of this webinar with you. And if you ever, however, did not manage to prevent it and you become a victim, please never pay the ransom. Because it will, because to begin with, it will not guarantee you that you get your data back and you will actually be feeding that dark economy and you'll be encouraging criminals to continue their activities because it's profitable, okay? So instead, report the incident to your local law enforcement agency. SPF is there. Um, try to find a decryptor on the internet. Uh, quite a few of them are actually available um, for free. And, and again, I will share the link. Um, from the No More Ransom um, website um, through the organizers um, to all of you. And hopefully that would be a useful tool for you. Thanks, Jeannie. Uh, Jeffrey, I do have a bit data breach now, don't I? Um, tying into yes. what you shared earlier, yeah. what do I actually have to do now? Uh, well, you know, it's the C-A-R-E piece, right? But contain is interesting because now contain really means how do I get my records back up online? How do I get my systems back up online? So unfortunately for something like ransomware, um, and you've heard from Jeannie that it's never a good idea to pay the ransom. Uh, and actually another reason why it's not a good idea to pay the ransom is because um, one of the things ransomware attackers do is they spot that you, you are an organization that's willing to pay, you might actually get revisited by the same attackers again, right? So the, the point, important point is if you can't pay the ransom to free up your data, uh, you really need to be able to fall back on another uh, uh, copy or backup of your data so you can restore what you can go ahead with if you can't decrypt. And so this is one of those things which I think, uh, unfortunately, it's about preparation, right? If you happen to run systems where the data happens to sit on premise or in your own systems, uh, you really need to have proper backups in place. Um, businesses really do need to think about going to cloud, secure cloud as a way of addressing, the, blunting the risk of ransomware. Uh, and the reality of it is that really the, the most effective thing that you can do really is to restore your data from a backup and, and proceed from there. But in terms of reporting, yeah, you do need to put out the information to the PPC that the records contained in the device or system or net or server or whatever was compromised uh, was actually compromised. Now, at that point, you will be making the report and indicating to the PDPC the kind of data that you have. 
Now, if it turns out that, I mean, I'm assuming that if everything on your server was compromised, you're likely to reach significant scale. Uh, you might also reach significant harm, depending on what was on that database, right? So if either threshold is triggered, you need to file the report. That means also you need to know what was on the server or the compromised uh, device. So again, it goes back to the step that steps that you need to take beforehand, which is to inventorize what you've got, right? All your assets need to be mapped. You need to know what uh, IT assets contain, what data, and so that when an attack happens, you know what data was actually compromised. And that makes your report sensible and you can make your assessment as well as to whether the report is required. So. Unfortunately, a lot of the things you can do actually need to be taken up front, which is part of the reason why uh, we're having this session, because giving you the advanced heads up that you really need to prepare for the day and you need to prepare for it before it actually happens, uh, that really is the only thing you can do in addressing uh, these situations. Now, once you file the report to the PPC, it will follow that the PPC will come back to you. The public send you a notice to produce, uh, which is basically to provide information to the PPC to further investigate and provide details. And thereafter, there'll be an investigation officer you need to walk the journey with, and they will give you uh, back and forth to be information exchange. And at some point you'll need to start explaining and, and giving an opportunity to articulate what happened. And hopefully it goes well for you or it may not, but either way, um, the PPC will come to a view. And all the things we talked about in the CERE framework earlier will then follow. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Ginny and Jeffrey. Although we have a limited time remaining, but let's consider some of the questions submitted by the audience. Um, as a reminder to our audience, you can still submit questions through Pigeonhole. Um, our first question is quite a popular one, and it's to deal, it's dealing with training of staff. Uh, specifically, uh, one of the scenarios posed by our participant is that, well, they have elderly staff who are actually not IT savvy, um, or even users who are not IT savvy. How do you actually help these staff guard against scams? Jeannie? Well, um, when we talk about older people, um, I think we have to understand why they are not so savvy. Um, a lot of it has to do with mindset, I think. Um, so people who are more senior, they tend to also be more, um, well, they grew up during a time where, you know, you could actually take a person's word for it. Right? You, don't, um, you don't have to enter into a contract for everything. And sometimes, you know, just a handshake gentleman's agreement will do. Right, so that's a kind of... Um, uh, a circumstance that they have, you know, a, a world that they grew up in. So they tend to be a little bit more trusting in that sense. Um, when it comes to IT savviness, I think um, it's not really true that all elderly people are not really IT savvy. Um, for instance, my mom um, uh, picked up YouTube even before me um, and she started going into social media websites, even social media platforms, even before me. So maybe I'm the older person in this case. But um, I think it depends on the individual. Um, if the question is about IT savviness and how to get them to understand and um, um, for, for their awareness on these issues to be raised and to be able to take the right steps to protect themselves and the organization from um, any cyber attack or any scam or any scheme or whatsoever. Then I guess um, there is no silver bullet to this. I would really just um, you know, um, encourage the organization to be patient with them. Yeah, Mindsets take time to change, um, as with all of us, whether elderly or not. Um, and people in general are very resistant to change. Um, but sometimes you know, I feel that delivering certain impact statements to them and helping them understand uh, how not doing a certain thing or not being vigilant or not practicing good cyber hygiene can actually lead to certain um, very unnecessary and, and, and negative circumstances or consequences rather, um, actually can help to, to in, in the education process, right? So just be patient and slowly educate them, um, help them raise the level of awareness and help them realize that um, they play an important role. That is my final one key point because a lot of people actually think that, ah, what is this one person, what kind of a difference is it going to make, right? It doesn't matter. Um, and anyway, I don't have very um, 
um, useful information in my computer, but you know, they may be wrong, but you know, just help them to see that point and that every single person in the organization matters. Have you anything that you wish to add? Well, if they're of a certain age, um, then, you know, it, it, and they're, they're resistant, it might indicate that their awareness generally of, of, of um, digital uh, um, habits as cyber hygiene is quite low. So one of the things that you could do is actually um, have them journey with a digital ambassador. The, I think the IMDA has a program for more senior citizens in that regard. And that program is more about helping senior citizens avoid falling into pitfalls and, and scams and all that. Um, <clears throat> so if they're of that type of age group and they're just not reactive or they're not um, savvy enough, you know, just journeying with them first, first from a personal perspective so that they become aware of these things and these threats from a, you know, as it means to them personally, they can bring the same sort of understanding to work the workplace and i think the digital ambassador program has a way of you know um has a pedagogy or a way of, of of bringing this to the to the individual that can help and that starts the first process then you know when they come to back to work and they have a better understanding of their own personal cyber hygiene it's a it's a matter of just transitioning to understand cyber hygiene as necessary at the workplace mm, just a question here jeffrey um this is related to the very first scenario where you advise that we reach out to have a courtesy contact to uh, pre-existing contact lists. Uh, the auditor is wondering, uh, what if there's no reply from this courtesy contact outreach? Do the organization have to remove these contacts? Well, if you're not getting a reply, there must be a reason. Right. Um, it may be that the person doesn't want to communicate with you further, or uh, it could be they just disposed of it. But the effective result is the same, right? That you don't have something positive in terms of a return back. And so really you're looking to continue to contact people who have actively wanted to receive information from you. And that's really the, 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 the safest way to proceed. You could try a reminder, you know, just to see, and then give yourself maybe two or three reminders and then indicate that this is the last reminder as a way of managing non-responses. But if you don't hear back after three responses, really, I think that's a, that's as good as saying no. Thanks for that, Jeffrey. Um, because we're running a bit tight on time, uh, we'll just take a couple of questions at most. Um, one of the questions here is, Jeffrey, how should a, an individual actually react if a company or a charity has been a victim of a cyber attack? How should the individual react? How should an individual react? Right. So let's um, say if I, I'm on, I know that I'm on that list. Oh, okay. Um, well, okay. So um, if you're concerned enough that something should be done and you're not seeing a response from the organization, so in other words, they're not being responsible and counting to you in some way for it, uh, then it is part open to you to make a report to the PPC yourself. Right. You can tell them that there has been an incident and they can take it up because it's it's also open to the public to to, to approach an organization. But of course, you do what you can first by reaching out to the organization who is in care of your data. So there would be a data protection officer often that you can reach out to to send queries and inquiries. And you can you know lodge a complaint, lodge an issue. Uh, and that gets you nowhere, that's when you can escalate and look into it. But separately, um, apart from reporting to the authorities, apart from contacting the uh, the organization and getting an account of what's happened, you, you may also want to start taking precautions right away, right? So your own internal passwords, you might want to change immediately. You might want to alert people who whose data might have been compromised alongside yours, your loved ones, relatives, reach out to them and let them know that maybe they should look out for suspicious emails and, and, and so on. And, and really it's just taking care of that around you in moving forward. Thanks very much, Jeffrey and Jeannie. Um, unfortunately, we've had to bring our Q&A session to a close. Um, at the end of this webinar, a survey form will pop up on your screen for your completion. We appreciate your comments as it would be used to improve future webinars. If your charity needs legal advice, please email us at assistnpos at probono.sg. We would like to express our gratitude to Mr. Chin, Mr. Noor Ismail, Jeannie, and Jeffrey for sharing your knowledge and experiences with us. 
on behalf of Pro Bono SG, Charity Council, and the Commissioner of Charities, we would like to say thank you to our audience for joining us, and we hope that you have a great week ahead.